greetings, and welcome to the First United Methodist Church in Bowling Green, Missouri. We hope you enjoy what you're about to see, and you can find us at the corner of Broadway and Church Streets at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Or you can find us at bgmethodist.org and on Facebook at Bowling Green First United Methodist Church. We lost a Sunday due to weather, so we're now in the third week of Lent. And coming up next is the second part of our series, Revealed. And it's titled, it's titled The World Revealed. And we'll be looking at the churches that Revelation addresses and the lesson that we're called to learn from them. So we're going to start this morning with uh, kind of a review of where we've been. It's been a couple weeks since we've been here. So uh, we're going to kind of remember that uh, what we're doing with Revelation. And the first thing we've got to do is we've got to take down a whole lot of the stuff we put on top of it because it gets in the way. And intentionally, you know, we've added stuff to it over the years, but uh, rather than make things easier to understand, it's made things a little bit more complicated and made things a little bit harder to deal with. So we're going to first remind ourselves of what Revelation isn't so that we can get into what Revelation actually is. And the first thing to know is that Revelation isn't a timeline for the end of the world. It was never meant to be that. It's not, that's not the intent of John of Patmos when he wrote this vision down. It's not meant to be a timeline. And in fact, it doesn't work well as a timeline for the end of the world. Uh, there are all sorts of problems when we try and do that. And we'll get to that in a couple of weeks, why that doesn't work. The other th another thing that it's not is that it is not a, a book of condemnation or judging other people. I know there are folks out there that do that, but that is not its intent. It is not supposed to do that. And again, it does not work well as a book to condemn or judge others. Uh, and that's not, what it, that's not its purpose. That's not what it was for. But that's the way some folks have made it into. And so we've got to take that away also. It's not even about Armageddon. Now, there's a lot of folks that will talk about this. They spend a lot of time talking about the Battle of Armageddon, but there are about 31,000 verses in the Bible, and only once in all of that do we have any mention of Armageddon, just one time in the book of Revelation, and then it doesn't get mentioned again. And in fact, this great battle that is supposed to take place doesn't ever actually take place because there's something greater that happens instead. It's not about Armageddon. Because again, remember, it's also not a timeline for the end of the world. And the next, thing, the, the next thing is it's not about having any sort of special knowledge. You know, that's a, there are many, many, many books written uh, saying they can decode, uh, they can decode the book of Revelation, and there's not any special knowledge there. There's not something that only the faithful or the real Christians can understand. That's not its intent. In fact, Revelation was a book that was meant to be understood by people, uh, and meant to be shared with others. And so anytime we sit and we try and make it about uh, a code or special knowledge or a secret that I'm going to share with you but not these other people, we're missing the entire intent of this book that was meant to be shared and understood. The problem is not in our under it's not in whether it was meant to be understood. The problem is we've got about 1900 years of history in between now and then that make it hard to understand and We've got all this stuff that we have placed on top of Revelation that gets in the way. Which is why we're taking off a lot of that stuff so that we can get back to the purpose and the intent of what's going on. It's important to remember that Revelation uh, was meant to be a book for hope, for peace, for stability, for strength, for comfort, for assurance, and for things of that nature. It was meant for folks who were hurting and who were struggling, who were being persecuted or who, or who were about to be persecuted or who could read the signs of the times and said things were going to get tough for them because they were, they were people of God. This is what they knew was coming. This was a book that was meant for them to help them through those times. Uh, there's a great definition that I love. Uh, this is from uh, James Eford, who was a professor out at Duke School of Divinity, uh, wrote extensively on Revelation. You remember a couple weeks ago, uh, I mentioned him and read this definition. 
Uh, he writes this as a definition for apocalyptic literature, which is the genre of literature that Revelation was written in. Uh, and it holds especially true for Revelation. It, apocalyptic, meaning apocalyptic literature, is always a call for faithfulness in the midst of persecution for the cause of God in evil times. Faithfulness in the midst of persecution for the cause of God in evil times. So the call is towards faithfulness. Anything in Revelation that does not direct us towards that means we are doing it wrong. Revelation and Scripture in general is hard enough on its own to understand. The Christian life is hard enough to know on its own uh, without us making it even harder. And remember, you've heard me say this before, and you'll hear me say this a lot, actually. If you have to jump through theological hoops to get something to make sense, we're doing it wrong. Which is why we have to remember the purpose behind Revelation. And even more so than that, we have to remember something else that's special about that. And that is, is that going into reading it, we know how this story is going to end. We know how this is going to end. That's why we started this series off at the end of Revelation, uh, remembering and reading about the, uh, the city of God coming down onto earth. The new heaven and the new earth being created. God is victorious. God wins. That's key. That's important. That is the light that we have to read Revelation in, is knowing what the end of the story is going to be, because the folks who heard it the first time would have understood that. They would have known that. They would have been reading it in the same way, because they knew how this thing was going to end. And so that's how we need to approach our reading of Revelation. Now, uh, the same holds true in our reading of the Old Testament. We read, as Christian people, we read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus Christ. So we also read Revelation through the lens of knowing that God is victorious. That we already know the end of that story. And that gives us, helps us to see that hope uh, all the way throughout. Now, Revelation came to uh, John of Patmos. Uh, John had been exiled to Patmos. Uh, he was a prophet from, uh, from around the area of Asia Minor that we're going to talk about with the seven churches. Uh, was well known in that area. And uh, he had been exiled to this island. And that's where he was writing from. And this is, and as he was, he was writing, he describes this in chapter 1, verse 10. He says that he was given a spirit, he was, excuse me, he was in a spirit-inspired trance. When he was, when he received, where he received this message, where he received what he is sharing through this writing, and that's important because it reinforces this idea, this excuse me, this understanding that revelation was meant to be understood. It was meant to be given to others. It was meant to be shared with others. It was meant to be understood. And in fact, in verse 3 of chapter 1, we, we see more of this. We see where, uh, where John writes, you know, blessed are, you know, basically saying, blessed are the folks who read this out loud. Blessed are those who hear it when it is read out loud. It was meant to be understood and learned from. And so, John goes to great lengths to prepare the people of these seven churches to hear that. And so he's writing to these seven churches. They are in uh, this area uh, back then that we call Asia Minor. Uh, nowadays, it's in the modern, the modern country of Turkey. And it's on the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, you can kind of see, you can see that you're kind of up there. Um, you know, kind of an area that we're somewhat familiar with nowadays. Uh, and so we had these seven churches, and now you can see that you could make it, you could probably walk from one to the others if you wanted to. I don't know that I would want to, but you can. And so that's where they were. That's a, these are the churches that are there. There are seven of them that we're talking about. Now remember our rules to reading Revelation. And one of those is never take any number literally. Uh, that's not the way that they're intended to be taken. It's not just that there are only seven churches that John is talking to. But seven has special meaning, has special significance. 
Seven is a number for something that is whole and complete. It's holy and divine, but it's complete. It's fulfilled, but with a sense of maturity that it has reached a sense of purpose, that has completed kind of its, its purpose. Uh, you know, a way of thinking about this is you can have a puzzle, a thousand piece puzzle, let's say, and you can have a complete thousand piece puzzle in its box on a shelf. That is a complete puzzle, isn't it? Now, the trick to this is, but it, um, it's complete, but it's not really complete, because it's not really complete until you take it out of the box, put all of the pieces together, when you get that last piece in there on your dining room table, and you stand back and you look at it, and you can see the picture that is now, uh, that the puzzle is giving us. Now, that puzzle is complete, it is fulfilled, it has fulfilled and completed its purpose as a puzzle, right? This is what we're talking about when we're talking about these seven churches. A complete, mature church. And these are the seven churches then that he was writing to. Now what's important in that for us is to know that these are well-established, developed, mature churches. Uh, they weren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. They had their issues and John will address them. The point being is that what we're given with these seven churches is a, is, a, is a spectrum that we can look at. What's important for the folks at that time, what's important for us now is that if we aren't a part of one of those seven churches, we can still see ourselves in that because John goes to great length to explain who they are and what he knows about them. And by giving us seven different churches to choose from, we can find ourselves in the midst of that. We can find ourselves in the midst of that because we are in a well-developed, established church uh, that is uh, that is mature, that you know is kind of doing what it's. We can find ourselves in the midst of that. No matter if we are being persecuted, might be persecuted, or can read the signs that persecution is coming, or if we are just struggling with things right now in life and things are getting hard and we don't know what to do, or if things are going okay and going pretty good, we can still find ourselves in the midst of all of this. We can still find ourselves along that spectrum of the churches that John gives us that he is writing to. So this is, now let's get down to the really important stuff. What John is doing in chapters uh, 1 through 5 is he is establishing where this message is coming from. It's coming from God, using lots of vivid imagery and vivid description. Uh, but these are things that will hold consistent all the way throughout Revelation. You'll see these things pop up over and over and over again as we read through them. Uh, so he's doing that. And then the next thing he does is he's establishing his knowledge of the churches and the people that he is writing to so that they will hear and understand and accept the message that he is giving to them. And he's doing this through his letters. And there are three parts to each of these letters that he is writing. The first part of it is the remember who. I call it the remember who. There might be a fancier name for it. I don't know. Uh, but the point of that is remember who is giving this message, that it is coming from God. If you take the first part of each of these letters and you put them together, you get a pretty good understanding of who God is using lots of that same vivid imagery that we see in chapter 1 and that we'll see all the way throughout Revelation that describes who God is and what he is doing and describes who Jesus is and his authority to do these things. The second part of it is, it's the, uh, I call it the I know you are. And then that's when John says, I know you are, and then inserts all this stuff about these churches. Where he establishes what he knows about them, what's going on with them. And in some cases, he goes from there and he says, and I have this against you, because he knows that they are doing some things wrong, that need to be fixed, that need to be changed. By doing that, he's establishing that I know who you are, and you need to listen to me, by golly. And those two things, taken in combination, are really important because it leads us to the third part of this, which is the call to action. And here we are getting one of the primary messages that is so necessary for when we are reading through the book of Revelation. And this is that call to action. What calling each of these churches to do something different. For some of them, it's just, hey, you know what, just sit back and just endure Hard times are coming, but endure through it. Take strength from your faith. Endure through what is coming. 
For others, it may be, it's something different. It's, uh, you need to change some of these things you're doing because they aren't quite right. For others, it is, you have just plumb done wrong, and you need to fix this or else, is the message that he gets. But always the, the, uh, the end result is the same. Ultimately, what John is calling each of them to is a call to greater faithfulness. Calling them to be more faithful. When times are hard, be more faithful. When times are good, be more faithful. When you're being persecuted, be more faithful. When you are about to be persecuted, be more faithful. When you can read the signs around you and know that things are going to be getting tough and persecution is on the horizon, be more faithful. That is his call to them because that is the purpose of Revelation. Because that is what we need to be, not just back then, but to this day, is a call to be more faithful. Why? One of the other major themes that we'll read throughout Revelation is that uh, uh, sometimes times are going to be hard, quite frankly. Anyone who ever says what you are a Christian life is easy are lying to themselves. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. That's just the way that things will be. But what we're told in Revelation is that while it may seem like evil is winning, and evil, evil will in fact win for a while, it's only going to be for a short time. It will win, but only for a short time, because ultimately, remember, we know how this story ends. God wins. God will win. We know how this story goes. Always keep that in mind, first and foremost. We know how this thing is going to finish up. So whatever we are hurting through or struggling with or suffering through now, it will only be for a time. Ultimately, God will win. So whenever something is hard or we don't understand, our first response should be to double down on being faithful first. Being faithful to God because He is what will get us through that. He is what will help us see, see us through. And He is also where our hope is pointed to because we know how the story will finish. So double down on being faithful. That's our call for today is to double down when times are hard or when times are good. Double down on being faithful to God. He will carry us through those things. It is through Him we can see our hope for the future. It is through Him that we can know that this will only last for a short time. For a, well, I should say a short time, but for, for a short-ish time. It's not going to go on forever. And God will be victorious, and we will see that great end come. So go this week. Double down on your faithfulness when you're looking at whatever hard thing it is that is coming up. Become more faithful. See what more God will do in you and through you. And see that God will carry you.